And so pain is a major factor in not only quality of life, but, um, you know, the, the way that we want to live our lives. And if we're feeling a lot of pain that's chronic, I mean, it can completely destroy our lives uh, just because it is so intense. So hypnosis is one way that we can begin to get control of that sensation, you know, control of the pain, to where we can then, you know, go in and have the, the medical profession go and repair what they can repair, reduce the amount of pain that we feel, and then make it manageable afterwards. Okay? But keep in mind that this thing has a definite lifespan. Um, and it, it is subject to uh, a number of difficulties that create pain and suffering as we age especially. The older we get, the more we encounter conditions of pain and suffering. That's just the way, you know, that is, that is a feature, a design feature of the extended world in which the body is a part. That's part of the rule that govern the body and the extended universe. Um, we will age and ultimately this organism will cease functioning. Okay? So that's why we're doing what we're doing here in this class. We are learning that we, the substance, the thinking substance that we are, the person that we are, um, the person that is listening to the sounds of my voice right now and, and understanding what I'm saying, that person is not the body. That person is something totally different. A person is, as far as we can tell, non-local, non-material, immortal. Okay, I mean all of those lists of things that the ancients talked about with regard to the soul. That's what that thing that we are is. Yeah. Um, there are different different people have different pain thresholds. Yes. Um, so does self-hypnosis work better on someone that has a high pain threshold and doesn't feel much pain to begin with? Or is that kind of... The, the issue of hypnotizability yeah. is kind of one that, that the research is still up in the air about. Um, and uh, in general, just in general, the population can be divided into those people, about one out of 20, about five out of 100, uh, who are extremely hypnotizable. And these are the kind of people that can be trained very quickly to manifest all of the hypnotic phenomena and who can undergo surgery with hypnosis only. So about, about one out of 20 can actually learn how to do that. So is that related to their pain threshold? No. Okay, so that's just a whole yeah, different Yeah, that's a whole other issue. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't seem to have, in fact, they've tried to correlate it with all sorts of things, with personality, you know, using the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. They've tried to connect it with, you know, everything. They've just tried to find correlations. The only substantial correlation they've ever been able to find is that the people who are most hypnotizable are also those people who have the greatest ability to imagine. That's about the only factor that seems to come up again and again and again and again in the people who are highly hypnotized. Okay? So that's that's one of the factors that is key. Now, the other 95% of the population is um, hypnotizable to varying degrees on varying days. <laughs> okay? It just sort of depends on what's going on. Um, they can, many of them can be trained to be very good hypnotic subjects. All right? Some of them cannot. There are some people who simply cannot, for whatever reason, they cannot um, go through the process to, to be hypnotized. And there are those people that are out there. Uh, there's one factor, and that is intelligence. If intelligence drops below about an 80 IQ, there's very difficult problems in hypnotizing that person. Um, 
but that's about the only steady indicator that we have. Okay? So, again, the, most of us are, are completely and totally hypnotizable to a very large degree. One out of five is very hypnotizable and can be, I'm sorry, one out of 20 is very hypnotizable and can do all of these, you know, seemingly miraculous kinds of things. The old Indian fakirs who would, you know, sit on beds of nails and be buried and control their uh, respiration and all those other things, those, they were that one in 20. So they were, you know, that special class of person who happens to be highly hypnotizing. Okay, any other? Oh, yeah. And what about our mental pain? Emotional pain. Emotional pain. Yes, exactly. Depression. Same thing. Depression, anxiety, uh -huh. uh, you know, fear, shame, all those kinds of things. Yes. Those are all, all elements of of pain and suffering. Okay? And those are also under our top-down control to hypnotic techniques. Yes. Uh, those are all on the side of the extended substance, which is the body. They happen here in the central nervous system, in the limbic system, in the center of the brain. We can actually map them out pretty good. We know the neurotransmitters that are involved. We know the actual physical locations that are involved. And so again, emotional states, physical states of pain, nerve transmissions and all of that stuff is on the side of the physical organism itself, the extended substance. Okay? And so, again, it is under potential top-down control from the substance that we are. All right? Any other comments or questions before we continue? All right. Let's just briefly review. This is the central idea that underlies all of Western and Eastern thought from the beginning. It is a dialogue among those people who investigate the nature of reality on how we are going to describe the fact that there are these two substances. Okay? And then, of course, there's the higher level discussion of whether there are two substances or only one masquerading as two. From, from our perspective, we are concerned with the dualistic approach. All right? For a couple of reasons. Number one, because it seems to be what really is going on here. Uh, number two, because it explains dissociation and related states, meditation, hypnosis, and all these other things. And number three, because we now have scientific validation of the idea that there are two separate substances. Okay, so if we recall from our early, from seminar one, um, ancient mystery religions believe that human souls are immortal and divine. Okay, non-local, non-material, immortal, non-temporal, that's what we are. Transmigration of these immortal souls around, you know, from body to body, from organism to organism. They had secret initiation rites where they used hypnosis and meditation and other kinds of things in order to demonstrate this to the initiate. Because that's what, that's what the initiate is learning. The initiate is learning the difference between what they are and what everything else is. They're learning to separate mind and body. They're learning to separate soul from body. That's what all of these things are directed to. And then they have rigorous training programs including you know, the somatics, the, the, the uh, calisthenics, the gymnastics, the yoga, the tai chi, the martial arts, all of that stuff, meditation and hypnosis. That's what they were doing. Thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, they discovered this, the two substances, and the relationship between those two substances. And all of the mystery religions were designed to train the initiate in, in these techniques that would allow them to separate. Okay? Plato now is attempting to conceptualize these ideas into a structured format so that they could be taught to everyone. Okay? So he, he described these two distinct but interacting dimensions as an ideal dimension composed of forms, what he called the idea. And he called that the world of being because it was, it was unchanging. Okay? Forms were unchanged. And remember, this is not speculation. 
This is actual experience based on meditative hypnotic initiatory practice. Plato is not speculating about the nature of reality. He is describing the nature of reality as it is revealed to people who practice these things. This is his description. Then there's the real dimension, the extended dimension, the world of becoming. Yeah. And in the Phaedo, the Phaedrus, the Republic, these are the places where he talks about these things. So if you wanted to go read them, you could. Uh, here's my copy of Plato. You can get all of these online. Just go out and type in the Phaedo from Plato, and there you have it. And they're all cross-referenced, okay? Uh, 109A through 111C, every version of Plato has the Phaedo you know, divided into paragraphs that way. So it doesn't matter which version you get, which translation you get, that will point to the same place. Okay, so he's talking about these two things, and I, I cannot stress enough, he is not speculating. This is not a theory. This is the actual way the world operates. This is his description of it. Now, in the Phaedo, he, he has Socrates talk about the process of philosophy. And Plato and Socrates says a philosopher practices death. This is the key element here. Because separating the mind from the body, separating soul from the material substance, is by definition death. <laughs> All of the ancient mystery religions had their myths of the journey to the underworld and then the return with valuable knowledge. This is their way of mythologizing the process of practicing death separating the mind from the body, separating the thinking substance which we are from the extended substance of the body. Okay? It was the philosophical method of investigating the dimension of the forms, the dimension of being, the divine dimension. Detachment from material objects through relaxation and exploration of the forms. So we have meditation, we have out-of-body experience, they would have called it contemplation, astral projection, all of these terms will now come into you know, the general uh, vocabulary as we move forward through the time. And uh, this, he talks in the Phaedo uh, uh, about practicing death. Okay, the Buddha, um, roughly about the same time, is also describing the nature of reality based upon his experience of the separation of the two suffering. He talked about mind, the world of illusion, suffering and chaos that out there, and Nirvana, the world of enlightenment, joy, and peace, the world, you know, of the thinking substance which we are. Uh, he talked about detachment and the meditative absorptions. Detachment was not a metaphor. It was physically describing the process of detaching consciousness from the body. He talked about eight meditative absorptions that meditative uh, practice would allow us. And so the first four, the first four sort of get us halfway away, and the last four get us completely away from the body. <clears throat> Aristotle talked about two distinct elements of reality, the soul and the material substances. Okay? And if you want to read about that, you can read the animal, which is concerning the soul. Yeah, they'll actually talk about that. Can the following plate. Yeah. Can you go back on the screen? Sure. <clears throat> So these are the eight absorptions that the Buddha was talking about. If we practice meditation or hypnosis, what can happen is the consciousness which we are separates itself further and further and further from the material world and its input until finally you reach the eighth absorption, which he described as the base of neither perception or non-perception. It gets very difficult to describe these things. <laughs> um, even people who have experienced them find it difficult to describe them. People who, are, who have had the same experience, of course, can describe them to each other because they have a common experiential vocabulary. But for those who haven't experienced it yet, it becomes very difficult to describe. So is this the same thing as like a person that dies? Yes. And has an out-of-body experience? Yeah, near, near, near death experiences. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Those are those are exactly the same kind of. Um, those are modern day. Um, descriptions of this. In fact, if we go back here, um, the myth of air, here in the Republic, 
The myth of error occurs at the very last of the Republic. It's in Book 10, and it's like the very last section of Book 10. And it tells the story of Plato, I mean of Socrates, when he is out fighting with the, you know, the, the Athenian army, and they have this massive battle, and there's bunches of dead people from both sides. And so uh, they, they call a truce, um, which for them meant like four or five days of going out and gathering the bodies, building the funeral pyres, having the funeral rites, and so on and so forth. So among the dead are Socrates' friend Air. And so, you know, they get him all prepared and have him on his funeral pyre, and they're just about ready to light everything, and he wakes up. And, and they say, oh, wow, this is kind of interesting. Where were you? <laughs> and he says, uh, well, you know, I had this uh, wonderful experience, you know. I got hit by this whatever, and uh, I found myself floating above my body, and then I went to this other place. And he describes the, you know, this other dimension, um, uh, and then he said, you know, I saw all these people, I saw people I knew, I saw people, relatives who died before me, I saw all these famous figures over there, it was divided into two sections, the people over here were getting ready to go back and be reincarnated again, but those people over there were done, they'd learned everything they needed to, so they weren't coming back. I was sort of floating around, because they told me I wasn't ready to die yet, so I would be sent back soon, um, and so, just before you guys were getting ready to <coughs> light your torch, they sent me back. So this is the one of the first recorded examples of near-death experience. Now remember, near-death experience is also, also mythologized in the stories of like Persephone and Demeter, you know, um, in where Persephone, you know, goes into the underworld, and Hades likes her so much that he wants to keep her. But, uh, so Demeter, her mother, has to go to Zeus and say, look, Hades has kidnapped my daughter and I want her back. And Zeus says, well, you know, what do you want me to do? I can't do anything. <clears throat> he does what he likes. So Demeter, who was the goddess of the harvest, said, fine. Until I get my daughter back, nothing grows. So we have six months of winter. Well, Zeus makes up his mind to contact Hades and say, hey, Demeter is creating havoc up here. Give her back her daughter. So Hades says, well, I like her too much. I'm not going to give her back <clears throat> forever. I'll give her back half a year. So she comes back to the, you know, from the underworld to the overworld uh, during the months of spring and summer. Demeter's happy. Everything grows and is green and happy. And then, you know, Hades takes her back to the other six months. Demeter's unhappy. She stops everything from growing. So these are, these are the mythologized forms of near-death experience. Going to the underworld and return. Separating consciousness from the body and return. Near-death experience. The method of error is one of the first recorded as a near-death experience. So this this occurs over and over and over again in the literature. Okay, and uh, enough with that. Okay, so Aristotle talks about that. Now Descartes is the um, 1596 to 1650, and he is the first, he is the founder of modern philosophy, because what he does is he says, okay, we've had this idea coming to us from, you know, many, many, many millennia ago, and he's trained in all of these techniques. He does meditation, he does contemplation, he does hypnosis, he does all these things, he's an alchemist. And so he has the same experiences that Plato had, or that the Buddha had, or that, you know, the ancient mystery religion practitioners had that Aristotle had, um, that all of these people that we hear about who are, you know, philosophers can, because they practice these things every day. And he says, we want to place philosophy on a solid foundation. Um, and what, we're, what we have to do is we have to recognize that there are two distinct, separate, but interacting substances. These substances he called the res extensa, which are extended things, that, this, this, okay, and race cogitans, thinking things, which we are, non-extended, non-temporal consciousness. Two separate, independent, governed by different rules, but somehow interacting with one another. And that then explains all of these phenomena. It explains near-death experience, it explains hypnosis, it explains the eight um, jhanas, the eight absorptions, 
it explains you know, all of these things that you know, are sort of mysterious unless you understand that there's two things going on here, not just one. Two things. Okay? And he developed a specific meditational method, which he called methodical skepticism. And it's, it is, um, it, it is um, he discusses it in his Discourse on Method, uh, Discourse on the Method and in the Passions of the Soul. Basically he said, look, everything that I experience in the external world, everything that I have an experience of out there, I can doubt. In fact, sometimes it's painfully obvious that what I thought I experienced wasn't real at all. It was either an illusion or an optical illusion or I was having an hallucination or I was not paying attention or whatever. So the external data that I get is not all that accurate and is not all that trustworthy. So I'm going to make that the basis of my meditational method. I'm going to doubt everything methodically. So for seven years he does this. And at the end he comes to the, to the, he, he comes to the position where he says, I've doubted everything except the one thing that I can't doubt. And that is the fact that I'm doubting. The fact that I'm actually doubting all of these experiences that I'm having. Something still remains that is in fact doubting and willing and thinking and reading and writing and controlling the body and looking out of all of this stuff. And that thing that remains is me. The consciousness that I am, this race Kajitans, the thinking substance that is Rene Descartes, that is L.D. Walker, that is you. That's what remains after all the meditative techniques are done. Same result. The Buddha says, sit down and, uh, you know, synchronize your breathing, and voila, what will happen is pretty soon, after you practice this for a little while, experience of mind and body in the external world will simply fall off. <coughs> and what's left is you. It's you, unadulterated by all this stuff out there. That's what you are, is this thinking substance, which is somehow interacting with the body and through the body with the external world, the extended substance. So it's again, the same thing, the same method. Descartes just wants to put it on... <coughs> Um, what we would consider a more rational foundation because the earlier methods were still sort of intertwined with the ancient mystery religions and religion in general, which is not a bad thing. But in order to found a new, a new method of philosophy, Descartes said we have to be a little more rational than we have been in the past because ever since we had the scholastics following from St. Thomas Aquinas for the last 400 years, so from about 1200 to 1600, he said the situation has evolved radically. He said because now we've got people getting their doctorates, writing papers on how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Because this is where it's gone to. You know, I mean, yeah, we can have all of these experiences out there, and we can go and imagine all these things, and we can speculate on all this stuff. So, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Can God create a rock so large he himself cannot move it? These are, the, these are the topics of discussion for doctoral dissertations for the last 400 years. And he said, this kind of stuff is not progressing philosophy. It's not progressing our understanding of reality. Uh, it is taking us off on these, on these tangents that are non-demonstrable and uh, basically fruitless. So he wanted to take it out of the, out of the world of uh, religion in general and put it on a more rational foundation is why he developed this method. Okay, the alchemist put yes. Um, the extended things include the body? Yes, the body is an extended substance. Okay, the thinking things include the mind. No. No. No, the mind is also on the side of the body. The body. Yeah, because the mind is... Well, let me ask you some. How do we think? What is the definition of thinking? How do we think? How do you think? What happens when you think? You use your brain. But what happens? What actually happens? What are impulses, you doing? Impulses, impulses, reactivity. No, no, not, not at the neurological level. What are you doing? Picturing things and more, more usually, not picturing things primarily, but talking, you're talking to yourself, okay? 
you're talking to yourself in your natural language. So for us, it's English, generally speaking. Those of us who may be bilingual or trilingual, of course, can think in other languages, but we're still talking to ourselves in a natural language. Natural languages are features of the extended universe. So mind, thinking, concepts, conceptualizing, imagining, all of those things are on the side of the extended substance, which you discover as you begin to meditate, as you begin to practice hypnosis, because there is a point at which thinking falls off completely. There is no internal dialogue. There is a point at which imagination falls off. There are no images. And what you are left with at that point is the thinking substance which you are, that which is you, that which is eternal, that which is not local. Okay? The thinking part is that which is you. The, the experiencing part, the willing part, the part that is thinking with a natural language. Yes, that's you. You are the one that is, that is telling the nervous system to think, to talk. Okay, but the nervous system itself can also talk on its own, as we have discussed. There will be this internal dialogue going on behind the scenes while we're concentrating on something else. Does that mean the pain? The pain is on the side of the extended substance. Yeah, the thinking, the 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 race cogitans, the thinking substance which we are, the non-local feels no, it does cannot, it, it does not experience pain or suffering or anything else like this. It experiences bliss. Okay, union with. God consciousness, okay? These are all the kinds of descriptions. The further it gets away from the body, the less pain it feels. And the closer it gets to its side of the equation, to hanging out in its dimension by itself, the closer it gets to this bliss relationship. Okay? Now, if we go back and take a look at the, at the absorptions, bliss will also fall off the further we get away. For even... These are all uh, uh, spatial metaphors, which of course do not apply. We're not really moving further away, we're just sort of disassociating ourselves from the, the body itself. Okay? So this is the way we discover what we are by meditating and by hypnosis and by all these other things. What we are, okay? What we are in our essence, this thinking substance, this non local, non corporeal, non material non-temporal, eternal substance that is consciousness. That's you. Okay? Uh, other questions or comments? All right, so the alchemists, remember, um, metaphorically are talking about the distillation of gold from lead. All right? And this is a metaphor for the meditative process of discovering the differences between soul and matter. That's what they're doing. They're not concerned with the actual transmutation of metals. We can do that. We can actually transmute metals. What's left over is radioactive, but it is, it is radioactive gold. It's real gold from real lead. Uh, but they were not concerned with that. What they were concerned with was the meditative process of extracting the gold of the soul from the lead of the body and the external and the extended world. Okay. And remember, the alchemists are, uh, from 1500 to 1700 CE, are just the, the continuation of a long line of people who practiced the ancient mystery religions. The ancient mystery religions didn't go away, they just sort of went underground and are still with us to this very day. Okay? Uh, the process was to place material in the alembic and slowly heat it until the distillation occurred. Okay, if we go back and take a look at some of the yoga texts, like the uh, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, he talks about the process of yoga as generating heat, tapas, heat. That's what we're intending to do. It's not, it doesn't really matter how limber we are, if we can touch our toes and bend over backwards and sit in a lotus posture, that will come naturally. What is important is the fact that we generate heat in the physical organism itself, which then produces the fire, okay, that 
allowed the distillation of the consciousness from the body. So we're all talking, to, all of these people are talking about exactly the same thing. They're talking about the same process, they're talking about the same objective, they're talking about the same <laughs> nature of reality, which is us, this non-corporeal, non-local, you know, whatever it happens to be, and we still don't know. And the extended world, which we're getting closer to understanding, but we still don't know. Okay? So key energy, classical mesmerism, talks about this energy of heat, and we'll, we'll do that next week. We'll actually feel that, the heat, the heat generation. Um, and that leads us um, into the meditative state, which then allows us to separate mind from body. Okay, now, Descartes, the 1600s, <clears throat> generated a whole bunch of good philosophical work. Okay, but by the time of the 1800s, again, we are finding this situation again in philosophy where everybody is going off on these speculative tangents and not focusing on, on the real, you know, straight through path of philosophy itself, which is describing the process and the results of the investigation of these two substances. So, Edmund Husserl, a, a German philosopher, said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're, we're in the same position that Descartes is in. So let's go back to Descartes and let's update Descartes. Let's go back to what he did and see if we can find a way of, of formalizing his method and bringing it up to date and, and adding something new to it that will make it better. Two dimensions of existence. He talks about the transcendent field and the immanent field. The transcendent field is a that, Descartes' extended substance, and the immanent field is us our internal experience, okay? Race extends and race cars time. He is now talking about an analysis according to transcendent field and immanent. Phenomenology is the study of essences leading to the transcendental ego, leading to what we really are by eliminating all of these other things, okay? And the method is called the phenomenological reduction. Um, the Greek word epochi, which is a bracketing, just means to bracket things. So where Descartes was going around doubting everything, what Husserl said was, let's modify that just a bit, and what we'll do is we'll bracket our experiences, and we will recognize the fact that we cannot, for sure, say that what those experiences are are real, that they exist. All we can say for sure is that I'm having that experience. Okay, maybe a dream, maybe a hallucination, maybe part of the extended world, but we don't know. So and we don't care, it doesn't matter. We're still having the experience, and the fact that we're experiencing this stuff, again, then points us in the right direction to experience us. Because we're that which is having this experience that we bracket. That we just sort of isolate it in our, in our, in our meditation, in our contemplation. Okay? So it's exactly the same method as Descartes' skepticism and of the Buddhist absorption. Exactly the same thing, just using modern German terminology. But again, the same process. Okay, finally we come to uh, the scientific side of things. We have two people who are investigating this, Dr. Carl uh, Popper and uh, Dr. John Edwards. Okay? Now, Popper is a professor, was a professor of philosophy at the London School of Economics until his death in 1994. Um, wrote bunches of stuff and was very, very focused on this relationship between expanded substance and other things. Dr. Eccles won the Nobel Prize in Physiology um, and Medicine in 1963 for his work on the synapse. He was the one who demonstrated that it is in fact neurochemical. Okay, so he, he shared the prize with other people. All right, he, they talked about this interactionism. They talked about it, and Eccles, in this book right here, Okay, which was the last book he published just before he died. This was published in 1994. This is one of the hardest books on the planet to find. I paid like $200 for it. Now there's like three copies left for sale and $1,200 for it. Okay, fortunately, you can find the two primary articles out of this book free out there. So you can just go out here. When I get this online, you just go out, click the links, it'll take you right to the articles. All right? Dr. Eccles said, wait a minute, 
we're now down to the molecular level, the quantum level of the nervous system itself. We can now demonstrate how a non-corporeal, non-local, non-temporal, non-substantial kind of thing that we are can interact with this nervous system and create all of these phenomenal things. He said, we can now do that. We now have the capability of scientifically proving that this is the way that it works. So this was a breakthrough, it was a massive breakthrough. Um, and since his work in 1994, he died in 1997, but since 1994, there have been many, many, many researchers in this area. We don't yet have the scientific technology to do what we need to do, but we're moving in that direction. So it, it seems at this point that finally, dualist interactionism, the interactionism between thinking substance and extended substance, we will be able to come up with a model. So what this model is saying is that this thinking substance, which we are, some kind of quantum wave phenomenon. We exist out here in this quantum reality, and we interact with this extended reality through the nervous system itself at a quantum level. Okay? Testable. It's a testable hypothesis. Okay. Uh, we're out of time. Any questions before we break up? Yeah. I would think that you said that a person a lower IQ would be not able to be hypnotized? Yes, very difficult to hypnotize someone with an IQ less than 80. I would think of, that a person with a lower IQ would be more submissive to hypnosis than a person with, with a higher IQ. Because? Because a person would be um, they would question it more, maybe. They would, um, with the higher IQ, they would question the diagnosis more and be more resistant. But they also, they also have the, remember, the key, the key ability, the one thing that we know that is linked to high hypnotic ability is the ability to imagine. Oh. Okay. Okay. And so people with, with an IQ of 80 or below are, are they do not, as far as we can tell, they have a difficult time to imagine. Because imagination, remember, immediately takes you away from the extended world okay. and the actual you know, demands of the extended world. Okay. So people with, with an IQ of 80 or below, they're more or less locked into what is really going on right now in the extended world and have a very difficult time detaching enough to have that imaginative experience. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. And so that that would be one way of looking at it. Yeah. And it's not a it's not a criticism of the person who happens to have this particular deficit. It's just the research has indicated that that is a, that that is a fact. And you know, so because it's very difficult to hypnotize those kinds of people. Okay, that answer your question? Yes. All right, any other questions before we go? We'll meet again next week. I'll review this. Go out online. This will be online by 6 o'clock tonight. Check out Dr. Echo's articles. They're kind of technical, but it's easy to get the idea. And you'll, you'll see graphs. You'll see pictures of the, of the quantum level structures of the brain, which are kind of interesting. All right. Yeah. yeah. And you'll be able to just link that with from the What you got. But yes, you can write it down www. Oh, my website is narrowgateallianceww.com. and get all one word. Got the large. Okay, and sometime right around six o'clock tonight or thereabouts, there will be a PDF version of the PowerPoint, and so you'll just be able to go to this slide and just read right to that. Okay, and it won't be, it won't be, and also you'll see all of the other things out there uh, with the passport. Next week, I believe it's on the passport. This week. Can I put it down with one? Okay. Same, same link, yeah, same link. Yep, to get, to get everything you guys are doing with the audio files. Yeah, the audio files are there. You just download, you know, right click and save as, and you'll be able to download all this stuff.
Oh, yeah, just right click and you'll see, um, depending upon which browser you're using, you know, save so as or save the link as. Or just look for the save. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then you just click on that and then it'll take you in your Internet Explorer. Or Windows Explorer, and you'll put it where you want. Can you go back to your first slide? Yes, I know. I know. You're welcome. Could you go back to your first slide that has all the, uh, the password and all that stuff? Sure. And where do you get the password? Oh, yeah. Okay. No, right there. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. So what did you teach in college? Or did oh, you? You I, I didn't teach in college. college. Uh -huh. oh, okay. Yeah, no, I was uh, actually on Wall Street for most of my career.